So what we're going to see in this section is the three different things that we talked about with these Olympians. The first in these first few verses is simply this, to assess where I am, to look at where we are in relationship with Jesus Christ. In verse 12, Paul says, I thank Him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord. He looks at his relationship with God and he says, you know, and Paul could say, I'm a very talented individual. I do great things for God. I travel all over the world. I'm an amazing man. He doesn't say any of that. He doesn't rely on his heritage. He doesn't rely on anything that is part of him. He looks to the heavens as if to say, I get everything that I am, all of my strength from you. You are my Lord. You are Jesus Christ, my Lord. And he says, and when you look at me, you have judged me to be faithful. I have been trustworthy. I have been following you with all of my life. If you were to look at your own lives and assess where you are, could you say something like that? I said, boy, I, I'm not the Apostle Paul. I don't know if I could write words like this. But at the same time, when I look at my life and I say, you know, there are so many times when I don't feel I have the strength to do what God has asked me to do. And it's not just because I'm a pastor. Think of your situations as well. You say, I don't know how I'm supposed to do this. Uh, maybe you have this friend that you've been trying to talk to about Jesus Christ and you've been looking for opportunities and openings and you say, God, it's not working. I, don't, I want to say something, but I don't have the courage. I don't have the strength. I don't have the right words to say. And God says, I can do all things through Christ. And Paul says, I just want to thank you for the strength that you give me. He says, and when you look at my life, you have judged me to be faithful. You have appointed me to your service. It was your call in my life, Paul says, that you called me to be an opportunity to be follower of you. Verse 13, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent. He says, I want you to look at where I've come from. He assessed where he was. He says, boy, you have given me strength. And then he takes a look back into his past. And he says, I, I thank you because of where I have come from. I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor and an insolent opponent. Now, if you know anything about the Apostle Paul, before he began a relationship with Jesus Christ, he, he, was, he was a torturer of Christians. He, he was passionate for the Jewish faith. He was a Pharisee. And this new thing called Christianity or Christ followers, or it was called the way, he says, this is, this is fraud. These people are not telling the truth. They are not following the true path. I have to correct them. And he was passionate to root out these people from this new cult-like faith. And if you remember his story, Acts chapter 9 says he was breathing out murderous threats against Christians. He would see a Christian or he'd see a gathering of people and he would threaten them. He would talk about them and he would say unkind things about them. In Acts chapter 22, telling his own story, Paul said he would persecute Christians to their death. He would have men and women thrown into prison. He, he would separate families from themselves because he was so passionate to try to preserve this religion that he had been trying to hold to. This is what he was. One commentator said it this way, threatening and slaughter had come to be the very breath that Saul breathed, like a war horse who sniffed the smell of battle. A war horse that just by flaring his nostrils senses that there's danger and that there's intrigue out there. Paul could sense where these groups of Christians were and he was going to sniff them out and he was going to do whatever he could to get rid of them. Acts chapter 26, he said that he would go to various synagogues to force people to blaspheme against the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I think around this world and especially in the last century, when the persecution of Christians has just been on the rise. And you can tell stories and, and you've heard stories or you've read stories of people who, who've been confronted by the authorities and they would say, if you will just deny Christ or if you will deny your faith, we will give you the food you need. We will give you the protection that you need. All you have to do is say that you don't believe in Christ anymore. Maybe you know someone who's been in a situation like that and what was their response? Paul was one of the attackers. He said, before I met Jesus Christ, I was the one who got in their faces and I said, you must deny Christ. You cannot follow Him. You must not follow Him. It's not the truth. 
Paul says, I was adamant for this. In fact, in the book of Galatians, another letter that Paul wrote, he, he admitted that his goal was to destroy the church of God. The, the reason I spend a moment on this is, if you know the Bible at all, and you know anything about Paul, we, we exalt him as the greatest of the great, the, the greatest evangelist, uh, the greatest soul winner, the greatest church planter in the early church. He's an amazing person. But Paul says, that's not who I was. I was a persecutor of the church. I forced people to turn back their faith. I, I challenged them to, to try to convince them that this is not the true way. See, when Paul looked and he assessed who he was in Christ, he rejoiced with the strength God had gave him, but he took a moment to look back and say, Father, you have shown me such mercy. He says in verse 13, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly and in unbelief. Now, ignorance is no excuse for not following Jesus Christ or accepting the truth, but he's saying, remember how we talked about mercy yesterday? Mercy is not giving us something we do deserve. In the eyes of God, Paul deserved to suffer and die in hell forever. But Jesus Christ, God looked down at him and through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he says, Paul, I offer you life. The one that you blaspheme against, the one that you, you yell against, he says, I am going to give you mercy and the great, verse 14, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. I love that expression, the grace of our Lord overflowed. I think of God's grace being so generous. Let me give you an example. I told you about our four children yesterday. Sometimes um, they have a treat or maybe we go to the store, we buy them a particular piece of candy. So we come home and we say, wasn't it a great thing that we bought you this particular piece of candy? Yeah, that was great. Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Dad. That was, that was great. And then we say, would you like to share it with your brothers and sister? And they say, no. <laughs> I want it all for myself. And I say, but I, I gave that gift to you. I mean, I bought it. I paid for it. You, you should want to share it. I don't want to share it. Well, can you share even a little bit with your, with your sisters or your brother? Do I have to? Um, yeah, you have to. So what they would do, and I, I could think of some examples of this, they would open the little bag of candy, and, they, and may, maybe it, we'll say it's M&Ms, okay? So there's like 25 M&Ms in this little bag of candy. Instead of dividing them out equally so everyone could have the same, because they were forced to share, they would look into that bag of candy and they would pour one into their hand and say, here, take it. And to the other child, one. Here, take it. And put one in there. Here, take it. So now I'm only missing three, but I still have the whole bunch to myself, right? Is that grace? Is that overflowing grace? No, not at all. Well, that's exactly the opposite of the kind of grace that he's talking about. He says, God's grace is so abundant. Imagine that you have this bag of M&Ms and you have the completely different perspective. And this is like a miracle bag of M&Ms, all right? There is no such thing. But the more that you give away, the more that your bag of M&Ms continues to be full. Would it be fun to give away M&Ms? Oh, it would be so much fun. Because as much as you would give away, oh, my sister, I love you so much. Here, let me give you 25 M&Ms. And you pour a whole bunch into their hand. And you look in the bag, and it's still full. And, oh, my brother, let me pour some more M&Ms in your hand. You give them a whole handful. And you look in your bag, and it's still full. You say, oh, my little sister, I love you so much. Here, let me give you a whole basket full of M&Ms. And you pour, and you pour, and you pour, and you pour until her arms are full of M&Ms. And you take it back, and he looks in, and it's still full. That's God's grace. Paul says, your grace and your mercy to me are overflowing. And you never use up the supply of grace. It just keeps coming and coming. And then I thought to myself, when I am a dispenser of God's grace, am I more like the child who gives one or the child who pours a whole handful? See, sometimes I'm very, our word would be stingy. I want to keep it all for myself. And I say, ah, I don't want to. And God says, listen, 
Everything you have, everything you are, is a gift of my grace. Give it away. Share it. And that's Paul's exaltation here. He says, the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. Faith, trust, belief, love, sacrificial, always giving, always thinking of the other person. He says, in my ignorance and my unbelief, I had no idea of the incredible grace that Jesus Christ had to share with me. He continues on and he says here, uh, the, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. It's interesting that at the time that Paul wrote this letter, he, he's not at the end of his life, but he's within a few years. His faith has had a chance to be uh, more deep and growing and more mature. Now, when I meet people who have a dramatic conversion experience, and they've been, maybe they've been an alcoholic or a drug addict or in an abusive thing, uh, almost immediately when they come to Christ, they just overflow in the expression of their love for God. And they just, and so sometimes the most dramatic that a person feels about God is in those first few days of their, their salvation. But when Paul writes this, and he's calling himself the, the worst of sinners or the foremost of sinners, he's now quite a few years into his Christianity. There is both a humility and a depth that have fueled such a rich appreciation for his faith that he can hardly get over it. That he's saying, you know, when I look back and I think about what I did and how I did it and why I did it, he says, I, as the years go by, I am even more amazed that he could save someone like me. And see, the thing about the Apostle Paul is he wasn't a bad person. He was an extremely religious person. I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up in a very solid Christian church. I've never been a bad person and so why does God need to save a person like me? I'm a good kid. I'm the oldest child in my family, and as the oldest child, I'm very, uh, I'm trustworthy. I didn't really ever mess up. See, what Paul is emphasizing, he said, does it matter whether you're a hardened criminal or whether you're a legalistic perfectionist? So that's what I am. I want to do things right. I want to, I want to make sure I don't do the wrong things. Paul says that whole spectrum, he says, the grace of Jesus Christ is applied to all of us. We are all sinners in need of a Savior. He didn't say, I was the worst. He says, I am the worst. He never takes for granted what Jesus Christ has done for him. I, I have friends in our church who are recovering alcoholics. And in getting to know them and, and uh, not having grown up in an environment of alcoholism, it's very interesting to me to talk with them about the recovery from alcoholism and from their addiction to alcohol. And these people will say, I am a recovering alcoholic. They never say, I was a recovering alcoholic. They know that the power of that disease is such that they will always live with the tentacles of that around them. The power is gone. They're not going to fall prey to it anymore, but they understand that what they are now, they continue to realize the freedom that they have and they never want to take it for granted. And that's what I see in the Apostle Paul here. In verse 16, he says this, but I received mercy for this reason that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display His perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in Him for eternal life. He says, I, I have been made an example, that in me, Jesus Christ is displaying his, his perfect grace, His perfect will, His perfect patience as an example to everyone. In other words, he's saying, listen, if God could do this for me, imagine what He could do for you. Timothy, you're getting tired of fighting. You're not sure what to do. You're not sure how to win the arguments. Timothy, you can't quit. You were raised in a wonderful Christian home. Your, your mother and your grandmother were a wonderful influence upon you. Don't stop, Timothy. Look at my example. Look back into my past and you'll understand how incredible God is and what He has done in, in so many ways and in so many wonderful things. And then he breaks out into this little anthem. 
to the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of the TFS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, visit www.tvseminary.com. I don't know if you remember me saying this to you in one of our sessions yesterday. I said, sometimes Paul is writing along in his letter, and I think he gets so overwhelmed with what God has done for him, he breaks into this worship. And that's what Paul does in this verse. He's writing along, and this is what I am, and this is what I was, and man, I just can't help but praise and worship. He is the king of ages. He is immortal. He is invisible. He is the only God, and to you be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And it's as almost as if we stop, and the letter is far from done. There are many, many verses yet to be seen. But Paul, as if he just stops for a moment, says, Can I just have a minute? I just want to reflect on how great and awesome and powerful this God is. I've assessed my situation. I've looked back into my past. And there's one little section left to be to, to look at in verses, 19, in verses 18 to 20. I must be persistent enough to succeed. Timothy, looking at who you are, looking at your past as I have done. Now, Timothy, let's make sure we finish well. Verse 18, this charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. I love this. Timothy, look at my life. Timothy, look at what God has done in me. Look at how He has changed me. Look at what He has continued to do. Timothy, you must grab onto that. Don't give up. Don't quit. Despite all the things that are happening around you, Timothy, you're my child in the faith. There were prophecies made about you. You're fulfilling them. I want you to wage the good warfare. You know what I like about those words? Paul isn't soft peddling this at all. Soft peddling means trying to say it in a nice way. Hey, oh, this would be the way we do it. Timothy, it's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. Just trust God a little bit more, and it's all going to be okay. Sometimes we, we take hard things and we put a little sugar coating on it to try to make it all better. Paul says, Timothy, you're in a war. You need to understand that you're at war. You can't quit, Timothy. Look at what Jesus Christ has done for you. I want you to hold on to your faith. I want you to hold on to your good conscience. I don't want you to reject it. Please don't walk away from it. And then he names these two men. Can you imagine having your names written down in the Bible as bad examples? We really don't know anything about these two guys except a little bit of what it says here. He says, they have shipwrecked their faith. These two guys, Hymenaeus and Alexander, you know what I had to do with them? I had to hand them over to Satan so they would learn not to blaspheme. I wonder what these guys were doing. Were they blaspheming and, and accrediting to Satan things that were the work of God? We don't know exactly what it was. We don't need to know exactly what it was, but Timothy knew who these two men were. He says, Timothy, you know who they were, and you saw what I had to do you saw how I had to turn them over to Satan to just strip everything away to teach them that they would not give up in the pursuit of their faith and their trust. Timothy, don't give up. Be persistent. Keep going. Sometimes I put myself in Timothy's place because I've had some medical conditions myself and I, I want to say, like Timothy, but Lord, I'm tired. Lord, can't anybody else help? Lord, why me? There are some situations in our church with some different people that just wear on you day after day after day. They're good and godly people, but they're, they're causing some strife and some division in our church. And we're investing all these hours and all this time in these discussions that they have because they're so passionate about warning us about things that 
we can't even hardly contain is like, Lord, I just want them to go. I don't want them to go away. I want the problem to go away or I want to go away. And I think that if Paul were here to talk to me or to talk to you in our churches, he would say, listen, people, you can't quit. You must keep going forward. You must continue to fight the fight because it is Jesus Christ who gives us the strength to continue on. So I want you to look at your lives as we wrap up this section. I want you to assess where you are. What is your relationship with Jesus Christ right now and today? Do you understand the strength that He gives you, the power and the passion to change your life, to transform you in the way you think and the way you live? I want you to take a minute then after you've looked at where you are right now, and maybe you need to just hit pause for a moment, and and maybe just take a minute and say, okay, where do I stand in my relationship to Jesus Christ right now, right here and today? And after you've taken a minute to think about that, come back and think about this question. Where have I been? Look back at our past. My past is not an evil or an ugly one, but it is one that is bound by legalism and perfectionism and all the pressure of trying to do the right things. Maybe some of you are like that. There may be others of you who, who, like Paul, were pursuing things with great passion and were just pursuing things in the wrong direction. Maybe there are some of you who are coming out of alcoholism or drug addiction or an abusive family situation and you don't even want to remember your situation. Maybe you're in a bad marriage situation and and, and you just wish it could be over and and the the abuse or the neglect just continues. Say, Lord, can you rescue me from that? And you say, yes, I can. And then once you've looked back and seen where God has brought you, say, Do I have the perseverance and the strength that He gives me to continue on? Not just as an individual, but as a church, as a community of people. I tell our people in our church many, many times over and over again, they probably get tired of hearing it, the Christian life was never intended to be lived alone. God is a relational God and He wants us to be part of community and relationships and connecting with other people and the the means of God's grace is expressed through those people. So assess where you are right now. Look back and see where God has brought you from. And then say, can you give me the perseverance, Lord, to continue in this fight for the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 20. We're going to take a little break at this point. And when we come back, we'll take a look at the first section of chapter 2. So let's take a little break. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift 